Welcome to the Sales Lead Dog Podcast, hosted by CRM technology and sales process expert, Christopher Smith, talking with sales leaders that have separated themselves from the rest of the pack. Listen to find out how the best of the best achieve success with their team and CRM technology. And remember, unless you are the lead dog, the view never changes. Welcome to Sales Lead Dog. Today, we have joining us David Cady, Chief Revenue Officer of Virtuous. Welcome to Sales Lead Dog, David. Thanks, Chris. Great to be here. Ah, it's awesome to have you on. David, tell me a bit about Virtuous. Yeah, happy to. So Virtuous, we are a CRM, marketing, and online giving platform built specifically for the nonprofit community to help them fundraise, increase donor personalization and donor retention, and generally drive more generosity in the world. So we are uniquely built to serve the needs of fundraising communities and nonprofits. That's awesome. I love that, especially from our world of CRM. Anything we can do to use CRM to help people and help organizations, it's a good thing. So yeah, absolutely. Um, you're serving as the chief revenue officer for Vitruous. How does this compare with you know, some of your roles you've had in the past working in a space that's really targeting nonprofits. Yeah, I mean, I think specifically in the virtuous world, when we think about our customer, there is a there's a strong need to truly understand who your customer is and speak their language and really sit on the same side of the table as them. Nonprofits are very trust driven yep. um, and uh, very risk averse, and so you have to be able to speak their language and sit on their their same side of the table. That's awesome. Um, when you look back over your career, what are the three things that have really contributed and driven your success? It's a great question. It's probably uh, hard to boil down to three, but I think as I think about this one, I think there's this idea of opportunistic risk taking and calculated risk. I think that is, is number one. It's sort of born out of this maybe opportunistic or uh, altruistic belief that you can continue to do more and believe that more is possible with with effort and input and sort of the, you always have more to learn. And so I think believing that more is possible. And then uh, I just had this sort of innate desire to, to build um, and to, to kind of like just continue to create knowing that the work is never done. And so that has just always sort of been thinking about, you know, what's next. Right. Any others? Gosh, um, I, I think, you know, think about a little bit more personally. Um, I just, I love people and having a chance to, to see uh, all kind of, both internally and externally, both working with teams and working with customers um, to truly come beside people and, and help them in, in a way that helps people win and helps them get more out of themselves, their systems or tools than they thought possible is, is pretty fun. So when you were a little kid, did you want to be a chief revenue officer? That's a great question, right? And I, I feel like 99 people that uh, out of 100 that you ask who are CROs today say absolutely not, right? And mine's the same way. I actually went to college and was a high school English teacher out of college. I taught high school English for three years. I wanted to be a teacher. No, and I think that's sort of born out of, you know, this idea of, of people is I was just fascinated by, right, helping people learn, helping people grow. And then that was the thing I wanted to do for forever. Um, I always know how long I've been in sales because it's how old my oldest son is. And it's been 16 years since I've made that transition. So I, I had this forcing function where I was a teacher. Uh, my wife and I had our first child and I realized how little money <laughs> I was actually making and how hard this was going to be. And so I kind of had this crossroads. It was a difficult crossroads in my life where it was like, I needed to find a way to support my family and start to build a life that, that we wanted. And I looked, took stock of what I was good at. I loved people. I loved teaching. I loved sort of like this being in front of people was not a hard thing. I also was, uh, I was a big nerd. I loved, I loved software. I loved computers. I grew up just tinkering on my dad's like 83 IBM. Like, I loved that. And so I, I kind of married the two opportunistically. There was a job in town with CDW. It's a big IT reseller. I just got a job making a hundred cold calls a day. First job in sales was very much the, 
here's the yellow pages. Go start making dials um, and learned a lot through that experience. Oh, I bet. You know, there is a real teaching component to sales, at least for me. Um, like when I'm selling, it, it's not so much selling as I am teaching them on CRM and what it can do for their business, etc. Uh, it's also a big part of listening. Um, so early on in your career was listening, you know, I imagine as a teacher used to really used to be up front talking a lot. Was it hard for you to mm -hmm. transition into a sales role where you have to listen really well too? Yeah, I think this the idea of of slowing down, right, is always the the I think one of the harder things for newer folks in sales is you have to slow down, right? Rome was not built overnight. Sales and deals are generally not closed in one day, especially CRM sales, right? We're right. many times selling transformation, right? This is a a large transformation. I always joke it's open heart surgery that we that we sell. And, and you have to deeply understand their why. And so sort of slowing down and being able to say, you're not going to close it, like solve it all on day one. And it does start with just understanding why we're here. You can't really help teach if you don't know what the gaps are. And that's a scary thing to do when you're new in sales, because you've got that number on the board. You've got those activity trackers that you're, you're looking to hit. And so to, to be able to sort of deal with this push and pull of move fast, but also this idea of, right, slow is smooth and smooth is fast and you have to slow down first. No, yep, that's interesting. Um, so how did you progress from sales into sales leadership? What was that transition or what drove that transition? Yeah, not it's it's funny to say because I feel like it's maybe the antithesis of, of what you'd expect from a CRO. It, it's reluctant in many ways, and I and I think this sort of desire to to help and desire. To, I always just got um, pulled close to problems. I, I love to sort of look at problems more as opportunities, right? And when you sort of shift perspective to realize that. Uh, most growth and most change and most forward progress is really just removing obstacles. And so you have to look at those things as part of the growth catalyst. Uh, I, I like to do that in a way that maybe made my wife uncomfortable because I was always trying to see like, what could I do next? How could I continue to stretch and grow? In a lot of ways that led to leadership opportunities um, where it was leading teams. And I think part of what I've enjoyed, right? That sort of fed the fed the teacher. And the first part in sales was how do I help customers see themselves in a different place, help them lead to understanding. And the next one is like, how do I help teams do the same thing? Um, at Virtuous, right? Like I, I, I was an early employee, uh, part of the early founding team. And I, I really just had this desire to build. And as you start to build, uh, teams start to grow and you start finding yourself uh, in leadership roles. And so the biggest thing that, that I love is helping people see things in themselves they didn't see possible. Um, there's, there's a biggest joy for me in leadership. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Helping people achieve goals, whatever those goals are for them. Yeah. Um, what's your strategy for building your team? Hmm. You know, it's uh, I'd be I'd be uh, I'd be lying if I said it doesn't. Um, uh, I still don't ask those questions a lot to myself. Um, if I look at sort of the things that I have found um, that generally seem to create great functional um, leaders and, and people who are experts in their role, one you have to have and show a, a, just a high degree of self-accountability, right? Like you take responsibility, the buck stops with you. Um, people that, uh, that have that innately, I think are incredibly important. I also want people who show motivation that's generally very even keel. Um, sales is an emotional roller coaster. Go to market and building is a very emotional, like the highs are high and the lows are low and they're fast and quick in between. And so you need to have motivation that is generally intrinsic and is generally not easily swayed. So no large uh, emotions, you have to generally be fairly focused in. And then other, like, I think the third element is 
I need people who are constantly seeking to improve and thrive on being coached, thrive on feedback. That might not always come from me, right? I want to, I do want to hire people who are better than me in many regards, but are constantly finding avenues to do that, constantly coming to me to see, hey, hey, what can we do? How can we improve? Do you ever find yourself too much in the role of teacher? You know, because a big part of your role too is is making mm -hmm. sure people are executing and delivering results. How do you manage that balance between teacher and also driving results or execution? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. Um, I would say a, a big part of that sort of <laughs> came through the early early days in sales. And I always joke with the team that you know this job is simple, but it's not easy. And what I mean by that, right, is in the world of go-to-market and, and sales, there is always a math equation that you have to solve. It's generally a series of inputs that lead to an output. And that equation has stood the test of time. It cannot be broken. It cannot be, you can't go around it. And you have to respect the equation. If you first and foremost don't look at the business in your role, in your day, in your week, as a math problem that has to be solved. Nothing else will really matter. That's foundational. So that's the 80%. And, and right, the early years of my sales world were very much born out of, I have to make this work because I have new babies. And if this doesn't work, I don't know what I'm going to do. So there was a desperation that made me like sort of love the equation and you have to love the equation. After that, that's when the sort of the, the, the fun, like your personality, the art, the sort of the why and the how of sales comes in, yeah. where you really can blend how to do this well, meaning how to do it with heart, yeah. how to do it with care, and still respect the equation. I think finding those and marrying those two things up are important. So it came out of a place where I saw it firsthand you can't just feel or hope your way right. to winning. It has to be, it has to be focused on doing the work and doing the right work every week. Yep, no, I agree. The uh, uh, we talked to this a, a little bit before we hit record on this. The it's really, I, th I think, in your role as a CRO because you're mm -hmm. measured on the results you're delivering. It's easy, I think, to become hyper focused on those results. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot that goes into those. You mentioned inputs, you know, knowing the inputs early and understanding the inputs. Could you talk about how you maintain that balance between the inputs and the outputs that that deliverable that everybody's measured on in a sales role? Yeah, I it's uh it's I would say the biggest challenge it solving that sort of pieces, I think what is the difference between people who can go for a long time in this world versus versus those who don't. Um, I have a great CEO who encourages me this way a lot. Um, he's very much a, um, he wants to win and he desperately cares about what we're doing. Um, but we have to sort of have a healthy apathy about the outcomes because I've seen this firsthand, right? Where I can get wrapped around the axle about how we get to this outcome. What's going to happen if we don't? What will people think if this doesn't work out? And I become way less effective as a leader, as a person, as an individual. I can't function. And so in some ways, right, it's a little crazy to think we're almost jumping out of a plane without a parachute. And we have to like be okay and tell ourselves like, yep, I know I don't have a parachute, but that's okay. Like I'm just going to focus <laughs> how I'm getting down and landing here. And to me, that's always been focus on the, the process and be faithful to what you put in every day. And to me, that means I'm competing against myself. I just want to get 1% better every day. And generally, right, time will tell you that if you do those things, nine times out of 10, the results in the scoreboard will reflect those things. Now, Markets do crazy things. Products do crazy things where sometimes it doesn't work out. And I have to, to be able to keep doing this year after year after year, know that it will come with some losses. And that doesn't define me, right? Like who I am, how I do things is the most important thing. 
I think it's the key to longevity, uh, especially if you're in a high growth uh, environment. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Um, how do you cultivate future leaders? Hmm. Yeah, it's it's a great question because I think there's a couple things I've noticed. Um, uh, part of it depends on the stage of the company. Mm -hmm. The thing that I have noticed about Virtuous as we've sort of gone through high growth over the last three years is pulling people close to problems. I, I joke with the team that like generally who you see advance at Virtuous gets really close to problems that we have. And usually they'll find themselves six months down the road in charge of that problem, which usually means it's a leadership role, it's a promotion, it's an advancement. And so that's the biggest thing for me is finding people who have good perspective and cultivating that perspective. I can take someone who's looking at a problem, who's coming with ideas to the table and give them training and tools uh, more authority, more responsibility, but I need them to know how to see problems, how to critically think. And I think that's the biggest element for me is when we see problems, how can I start to delegate these to people who show this aptitude and then resource them as much as possible during that? And yeah, I mean, I've seen uh, so many people at Virtuous flourish in that regard, right? Yep. A lot of times it's not, there's, there's not always a set playbook for do these things, then this will happen and solve these problems. Generally, you're going to create opportunity that didn't exist because of that. Generally, you will be the steward of that opportunity because you've shown trust, right? We can trust you with those things. And so, yeah, I think it's trusting people, giving them that opportunity and then letting them fail, letting them work through it, but, but always giving the opportunity when you see it. Yeah, I think that letting them fail piece is so important um, that, uh, you know, it's the best way, it's the best tool for learning. I, I've just, you know, all of my years, it's I've always learned more from, and I think everyone agrees with this, you learn far more from your failures. Um, mm -hmm. And what you said, too, about looking for those problems, I say the same thing to my kids and my nieces and nephews. I'm like, you want to really... Um, cement yourself in, in a role, especially early in your career, be that person that's volunteering that says, hey, we've got mm -hmm. this issue. This is always a problem for everybody. I'd like to tackle this problem. Raise your hand, volunteer, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, and, that's and right. bec become an expert at something, you know, then that's how you cement yourself in a role and you move things forward. And uh, um, you can't just sit back and wait to be tapped on the shoulder. That's right. Yeah. And there is a, a healthy amount of experience and education that comes from tackling problems that get you ready to be in a leadership role. Um, I think people that sort of come come to that with a humility too. It's like I'm I'm more concerned about the problem, less concerned about how I'm going to be a leader. Right. Those are the people that are going to be great leaders. Oh yeah, hundred percent agree. What's your biggest struggle in a role as CRO? What's that? Do you have just one thing that maybe vexes hmm. you on a regular basis? Yeah, it's uh, it's been interesting as you know, Virtuous has grown. I think it in one in some ways it's it's a lonely position, um, and I don't say that because I'm like trying to create you know people <laughs> to feel feel sorry for me or anything. It's 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 a, it's a burden I happily bear. The the fact that um, I think many ways you will have people who are rightfully mad at you and wrongfully mad at you almost all the time. Right. And decisions start to become, it's, it's hard to emotionally remove yourself from decisions when you sort of see people and families and, you know, um, people's goals all sort of intermixed with numbers. And yeah. uh, I would say it's a, it's a constant, perspective growing exercise the more you increase in leadership and yep. you know i kind of uh um I've, I've equated virtuous in our growth to sort of like raising a kid from zero to 18 but doing it in the course of four years like the amount of change and the amount of sort of ways that you have to grow and adapt yep. is really stretching um and constantly self-reflecting on on those things and sort of you know, I think surrounding yourself with 
peers and people who sort of have a, a disconnect from the the day to day of what you're doing to give you sound, thoughtful advice and people that have sort of walked the road ahead of you. Um, I think that's that's hard because I do my core right. Like I want everyone to succeed. The, the the sheer fact is like not everyone will be able to in the environment or the culture that we build, right. and that's sometimes hard to swallow because you want it to be true. Yeah, it is. It's really hard. Um, it's hard as a parent. It's hard. Any role where you have oversight like that, it's super hard to see yeah. people struggle. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's thank you for sharing that. Um, do you have a particular loss, you know, that deal you thought you were going to win and <laughs> you lost it? that you could tell us about and how you leverage that in your current role yeah. as a CRO? I do. I have a really big one. And it was, I had a, you know, I've had, it's funny because the the wins you tend to forget pretty quickly, but the losses, man, they stick with you. My wife just reminded me of this loss about a year ago and where we were and what I was doing. Oh my gosh, that, that was a hard one. Yeah, it was really, um, it was my first sort of field sales role in what I would call a true enterprise software sales. And um, one of the largest deals, you know, one of the largest expected commission checks I would have you know, received in my life. And at that point, not far removed from the world where I still remember, you know, being on food stamps and being a teacher and sort of like thinking that, you know, this was right during the, the height of I went into sales like right during the height of the financial collapse in 2007 and 2008 and very close to that. So it was, and, and I think this is where I learned about being faithful to the process and not always the outcome, because I put so much weight in what is going to happen to us, to our life, to, uh, to my ability to be, to be successful if we close this deal. So the funny part is um, this company no longer exists. The deal was with Sky Mall. If you remember, no right, the, yeah. the magazine oh, yeah. and the airplanes that you used to buy stuff that you didn't need. Yep. Um, and they were looking at replacing their ERP. And uh, we, you know, had executive alignment with the right people, all of that, and it ultimately came down to a board decision. So many different things that we, that you know, that maybe didn't plan for accordingly. I didn't learn, you know, part of it was not like a oh, in my sales process, I should have what it really was. Was if every if all of my chips are my identity, who I am, are on this outcome, I won't be able to do this job for long. Right, and it wrecked me. Right, because we lost the deal at the eleventh hour. Now the funny part, the irony of all of this is the next year Sky Mall went bankrupt. Yeah, and no longer exists. And so there was some there was some sweet irony in all of that. That they oh, I, yeah. I always joke to say they picked the wrong ERP. Yep. at that point. Yep. Um, but yeah, that was a big part of like who I am and my success will always be defined by how I work and what I do and not necessarily the scoreboard, which is hard, right? Because that's not always what you're taught in a go-to-market or sales environment, right? Like a lot of times your self-worth is what is on the board. That's right. Now that can motivate people for a season, right. but again, we like I want to play the long game here. And so how do you respect the scoreboard while still sort of being able to do this for a long period of time. And that was a, that was a big learning lesson for me with that. That was, yeah. you know, I think changed how I perceived things and sort of the weight I, I put on, you know, oh, yeah. each deal. Managing those, those losses, um, they can be really, really hard, you know, especially when you realize like you're thinking like this deal, man, if we get this one, it's going to change everything, you know? Yeah, and, that's right. Uh, and you lose those. And it's like, oh, I've had the same experience, you know, where it's like, <laughs> oh, yeah, they stick with you, you know. Yeah. But it's funny, I have a similar one where it's like if we had won one and and pursued through and I had all good, it same thing happened where the company like uh, within a year was out of business. I'm like, <laughs> it would have really hurt then. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true when you close it and then they can't afford to pay the first they year's can't afford invoice. To pay. It's yeah, worse. It's yeah. like, man, that, that hurts. Um, that's right. So, yeah. Um, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about um, CRM. You guys sell CRM. Yeah. So I'm really interested to hear about um, 
you know, the stories of your customers and mm -hmm. how CRM, you know, what, what it was like before Virtuous and what's it like after Virtuous? What are these pain points that you guys are addressing um, for these nonprofits? Yeah, and you know, the nonprofit space is interesting. It, um, the technology in the space is incredibly, um, there's a lot of legacy. And I'm not talking legacy as a 10 or 15 year old, I'm talking 30 or 40 year old technology. Yeah. And so many times, right, most of our end users, so we serve um, heads of development, fundraisers, marketers at nonprofits. So these are the ones who are out building relationships with donors. Um, so the interesting part, right, is the act of giving, the act of generosity as a donor, it's generally a very deep and meaningful personal thing. People don't just write checks right. absentmindedly. They do it with a deep intent. And so the relationship that they receive back from the nonprofit is incredibly important. Like they want to be a part of something right. when they give. And so it's imperative, right? Like to build relationships. Yet the nonprofit space from a technology standpoint has had technology that does not help or serve building relationships with donors well. And really has sort of treated donors like just a, a row of data and a database, right? Many of the tools they use are just their databases. And so there's this huge gap between the fundraisers who are doing the work and the technology that's serving them. They aren't able to know truly who donors are. And especially as you become a larger nonprofit, you got five, 10, 30, 50,000 donors. You might only have five people who are making phone calls there, right. but yet you have people who deeply care. And so being able to truly illuminate who your donors are, give fundraisers tools that help them scale out personalization to know donors better, um, just increases the generosity that donors will give back because it's so linked to why they give, right? Like knowing them well is the part, is the biggest part and building relationships is the biggest part of how they raise more money. Yeah. Um, when they come to you, um, with CRM, is there a common thread of what's their why? You know, what is it that, mm. that they're seeking in their new CRM? Yeah, I I think uh, you know it's funny. A lot of a lot of times we'll we'll have customers that it's hard for them to describe. They're just frustrated, right? They sort of reach this point where they're not really sure what they need. One of the biggest challenges that they do have, though, is because giving is so personal. Um, many times uh, statistics show that 76% of donors never give again after the first gift. So retention right. is incredibly important, right? They have such a leaky funnel that they're constantly trying to put more donors back in the top, but they are losing them. And so it's the, how do I keep someone giving over and over and over again? Right. And the key to that, that we found, right, is, hey, being responsive to the donor, meaning meeting them where they're at. You might use multi-channel marketing. You might call someone like you might um, inquire with them about why they gave because you understand that they gave to the school building project and not your um, right other capital projects. All of those things, those data points are helpful for, for nonprofits. But yeah, the biggest thing is, hey, we want to grow giving. We have this sort of, I think the, the amazing part too about nonprofits is there's this altruistic desire like we do want to create deep relationships with our donors. We don't know how to do it anymore. Like we've, we've reached this capacity of people and process yep. and they're stuck. Yep. There's real parallels there to the for-profit mm. world. Yeah. Um, you know, listening to you, there's some real parallels there that um, I see this a lot in my world where people are so focused on net new logos that we got to mm. get new stuff, new, 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 new. They forget about that sometimes and oftentimes the best place to drive more revenue and growth is your existing customer base. You've already spent all this money to acquire them. That's right. And to build that initial relationship. Now you need to drive that the you know, continuing engagement and how else can we grow the relationship and manage that? I see that all the time. Um and yeah. it's, it's surprising to me um how common a struggle that is. That's right. I mean, I think in, in all areas, um, whether in the for-profit or nonprofit world, customers or donors alike are, are very much driven by trust. They want to continue to do business with people they trust, believe in, know, and understand. And so 
that is the key, I think, to longevity and retention and growth is people don't want to do business with nameless, faceless organizations or businesses. And the more you understand who the customer is, the closer you get to them. Like people do want to be customers for life, right? It isn't necessary. The world isn't as transactional. I believe with some of these decisions anymore, they do want to be thoughtful uh, about where they, they spend their money. Yep. And so it, it, it takes that, um, in t- what I call intentional focus, you know, on that relationship, you know, that you have to have a plan, like, how are we going to grow mm. the relationship? You can't just let it or hope it happens organically. That's a, you know, if you can have that plan and have that supported by your CRM, CRM is a great tool to drive mm-hmm. that plan of engagement, you know, to, to grow the relationship. I tell people all the time, it's the R in CRM, it's relationship, mm. right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Um, do you have any great stories that you can share of like customers that you've, like they come back to and say, just want to share with you how much Virtuous has impacted our organization? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the thing that will, that's always the proudest achievement for me is um, winning, but winning the right way. And what we start to, when we start to get feedback all the way from starting all the way back in our marketing messaging to the sales process that they go through, through implementation and onboarding and success is, is virtuous just felt different. Right. And I, I always, you know, call it, you know, same side of the table, like you were a partner and you spent the time where I, otherwise I felt sold or otherwise I felt like I was being rushed. It is playing the long game, which is really hard yeah. to do, but it's the belief that if you do it right the first time, customers will stay for a long time. Yeah. And that's, I mean, if we're talking enterprise value and if we're talking what matters in growing businesses, like retention and, and NRR growth and all of those things, it starts all the way at the beginning. Um, and that is the most important thing. And so I think it's when we hear that, I, you know, the nonprofit space has also been just underserved for so long that it's a big mission for Virtuous to say like, we, we need to help people who have not, have been underserved and undervalued for a long time. And we want to create like an Apple like experience, quality of product, quality of experience that they have with us that makes them feel like it's just as good. It's second to none, right. As anything else. And so that that's the fun stuff. It's also amazing too, when you hear how, what we do impacts the outcome of their own fundraising of their own growth, Um, hearing stories of 400% growth for, for missions and all these outcomes that are great outcomes that our, our customers are having to impact the world in a positive way is Oh yeah. Uh, it's really cool. That's really cool too. Cause you think about that, like if they're do- increasing 400%, that's 400% more people that they're helping. They're having, right. this, it's a ripple, that ripple effect. And that's where I talk about this with guests all the time on, on sales lead mm. that sales is not a bad thing. You're helping people. Yeah. You know, so many mm. people have a negative connotation with sales, but when you're helping fix problems, you know, it's what you're talking about, fix, identify those problems, fix them, have an impact. It's a ripple yeah. effect. You know, making that's right. Better. That's right. Yeah, I, 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 it's part of our onboarding, our training at Virtuous, right? My big passion of mine is like, how do, how do we redeem and and just reprioritize the sales profession in general? Yeah. You know, sales is sometimes looked at as a four-letter word. Um, it starts like you know, it requires people to believe that like we're playing the game on hard mode. Doing sales the easy way is cutting corners, is shortcuts, is things that doesn't serve customers. So not everyone can actually do it, but done the right way, right? Like all we're doing is bringing customers close to a solution or outcome that they're already expressing they need. We're just guiding them there. Sometimes we got to pull a little harder. Sometimes we got to push and ask hard questions. It might seem uncomfortable, but like it's coming from a place of, hey, we're genuinely trying to get you to place. I think you're asking, you're you're telling us you want to go. We may not be the right fit, but we're going to really try to see if, if, uh, if we can guide you best. Oh, yeah. Done well. It's, I, it's the greatest job in the world. It's the it worst really job is. in the world if you do it wrong. Worst oh, job in the world if you do it wrong. Greatest totally. job if you do it right. Couldn't agree more. It, <laughs> it's like you said earlier, it's like doing open heart surgery. It's telling people, hey, look, mm-hmm. what we're going to take you through, it's transformational. It's going to be painful at times. But it's like you're you're bursting out of this cocoon 
and you're going to be this beautiful butterfly when we're done, you know, that yeah. it's like truly what we're talking about is transformational when it's done the right way. That's um, right. So that's awesome. Uh, David, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your of busy schedule to come on Sales Lead Dog. Um, if people want to reach out, they want to connect with you, if they want to learn more about Virtuous, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, hit me up on LinkedIn. You'll find me uh, anywhere on LinkedIn. I'm happy I message uh, people all the time. Virtuous.org is the Virtuous website if you want to learn more about that. And I'm an open book, love conversations, love to talk to people, love to meet. So find me on LinkedIn. That's awesome. We will have all of that information in our show notes. You can get that at impellercrm.com forward slash sales lead dog, where you will find this episode along with all our other episodes of sales lead dog. So be sure to check that out. Check out these show notes um, and connect with David. David, again, thank you for coming on and welcome to the sales lead dog pack. You bet. Excited. As we end this discussion on Sales Lead Dog, be sure to subscribe to catch all our episodes. On social media, follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Watch the videos on YouTube. And you can also find our episodes on our website at impellercrm.com forward slash sales lead dog. Sales Lead Dog is supported by Impeller CRM, delivering objectively better CRM for business, guaranteed.